Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for um, our workshop Wednesdays. My name is Michelle Pouchot, and I'm the program coordinator for ASALA, the Association for the Study of African Life and History. Um, today, we're going to start with hearing from Dr. Nikki Taylor, who joins us from Howard University. We're so glad she's here and that without her, we wouldn't be here tonight. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Thank you so much, Michelle. Hello, audience. And I just want to, on behalf of Howard University, thank you for all attending our Social Justice Workshop Wednesdays. Uh, the idea for this, these workshops in the following four weeks came out of a collective conversation between Howard University and the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And we decided to apply for a grant. And we won a $5 million grant. And that is to, for three years, focus on the work of social justice. And so we have a lot of partners, but ASALA is our most significant and our most important. So we're very honored that you came to join us today. If you want more information, about this grant and our activities, please email me at nikki.taylor at howard.edu. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. We're so happy to have you with us tonight. I'd now like to turn it over to the president of ASALA, Dr. Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham. Welcome to the Social Justice Workshop of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, ASALA as we call ourselves. And we are hosting five social justice workshop Wednesdays as part of the social consortium of Howard University, my own alma mater. And this larger project, as you just heard from Dr. Nikki Taylor, was made possible by the Just Futures grant of the Mellon Foundation. And we came together, Asala and Howard, to speak to the importance of dialogue between the academy and the community, between teachers and faculty and local leaders of community organizations. And this is the great characteristic of Asala a characteristic that dates back to the founding of ASALA in 1915. We are an organization that brings together academics and people from all walks of life, young and old. And why do we do this? Because for 106 years, ASALA has operated from the premise that racial equality and social justice must be fought for in America, not only by legal suits in the courts, not only by marches in the street, but also by knowledge, by knowledge of our history, by knowledge of our rights. And those facts must be presented inside and outside of the classroom. So we do this every year at our annual conference, which is going on right now. So please go to asala.org and see our exciting annual conference. But we are in the unique position this year, and we are honored to have the opportunity to offer this five-part workshop for broad public audience participation. And we begin the first of our five-part series with Social Justice 101, understanding the language of racial oppression. And this Workshop is presented by Dr. Lisa Brock. And Lisa Brock, we are so honored to have you. She is the founding academic director of the Arcus Center for Social Justice Leadership at Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo College. She is a lifelong social justice activist. She is the retired professor of transnational black history and she's also a graduate of Howard University. Before I turn the workshop over to you, Dr. Brock, I would also like to introduce Michelle Purceau, who you've already met. She is the program coordinator for the ASALA 
Howard Mellon Just Futures grant. And she will provide you brief information about the other upcoming workshops. They're gonna be exciting. And also instructions on how tonight's webinar will proceed. Michelle. Thank you so much, Dr. Higginbotham. Uh, so we have five workshops. Tonight is Social Justice 101, Understanding the Language of Racial Oppression. And Dr. Lisa Brock will be presenting our next two workshops as well. On September 22nd, Social Justice 102, Understanding the Language of Black Liberation. And our last September workshop each Wednesday is on the 29th, History of Policing and Communities of Color and Its Implications Today. There'll be two additional workshops in October, again, the first two Wednesdays, and those will be hosted by uh, Serena Sebring, Dr. Sebring, and as well as Alice Kim and Emily Hooper Lansana. So I, 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 I'm encouraging you to go online and sign up for all the workshops. It'll be an exciting uh, five weeks. Before I go on any further and turning over to Dr. Brock, I just want you to look at your screens and know that today is an interactive session. And so we'll be using the chat. I see many of you entering information in the chat now. Please use the chat, introduce yourselves to each other and let us know how you're doing but use the question and answers tab to send your questions. We'll be monitoring each of these groups and we'll be uh, advancing information to Dr. Brock for her to give you answers and um, to enhance the participatory nature of tonight's webinar. And I want you to look at one more thing, which is raise hand. During a part of the session, we'll be asking if we can bring a few of you in to share, and we're going to ask you to raise your hand and put something in the Q&A. So please feel free to participate. It'll be that much more interactive. Without further ado, though, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Lisa Brock. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much to uh, Dr. Brooks Higginbotham and uh, Michelle and the team that uh, put this thing together. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I go by she, her, hers. Um, I'm a historian, a social justice activist. I'm a justice education, diversity, inclusion consultant. Um, I also like to always start with some contemporary issues that I think are so important. It was really, it's really uh, important that Asala sees itself and has always been um, a place where community folks and knowledge of the Black community come together. And I use this term praxis, which means the, the, the best theory, which we're going to talk about today, comes from good practice, and the best practice comes from good theory. And so I just wanted to alert everyone to the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act of 2021. And please, please, please do all we can to support reproductive rights. Um, I'm dedicating my talk today to Dr. Aziz Batran. Uh, he was my history professor uh, while I was at Howard. He was uh, very, very um, important to me and uh, I've never had an opportunity to really honor him in any way. And so I wanted, since I'm participating in this event with Howard, I wanted to um, dedicate this to Dr. Aziz Batran who was a history, who was my history professor uh, when I was at Howard in the 70s. And I don't think I would have gotten a PhD in African history and transnational black studies, if not for Aziz. So what we're gonna do today is Social Justice 101. Um, for some of you, um, I'm gonna share these terms and concepts to give us a better understanding of the language of racial oppression. Um, for some of you, this may seem basic. Uh, for others, this may be new. Uh, my hope is that it will stimulate us to develop a common understanding of how racial oppression works. Uh, so many people in America that we've seen on YouTube like to say, I'm not racist, but they have no idea how racism actually works. 
And so today we're gonna to talk about some terms, some concepts, some narratives. I'm gonna share some stories. We're gonna have people reading these terms. I'm gonna ask you to share some stories. And, um, and then we'll end with talking about next week's, uh, I'll just alert you to next week's terms, which will be terms like intersectionality, abolition, reparations, in terms of terms of, of black liberation. So right now we're gonna uh, keep, we're gonna go to our terms and our narratives. And um, I'm gonna read the first one. And then we have some people who I think have, from Asala, who have agreed to help me uh, read some of these. Um, so, hold on. Okay, race. What is race? A lot of, we, we think we know what race is, but very often we don't know why we know what race is. Um, race is a specious, historically constructed, sociological classification entrenched by Europeans during the time of their worldwide expansion of colonialism, capitalism, and slavery. And that's roughly between 1300 and 1888. Um, and they constructed this thing called race to assign human worth and social status using themselves as the model of humanity for the purpose of legitimizing white power, white privilege, exploitation, and oppression. There were other stark strata, caste, religious divisions, gender divisions before this, but rarely have they been based and rarely were they based on skin color. Race increased as a weapon of power used by emerging nations, economies, and empires of the global north in order to gain access to peoples and resources of BIPOC communities. And by BIPOC, I mean Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities and nations throughout the world. So race, and when I say specious, I mean it's, um, it's dastardly. It actually, we're all a part of the human race, but race was constructed for certain purposes at certain times um, to allow one set of folks to exploit and gain power over another set of folks. So it's played an important role. So can I have my next reader of the next, uh, and um, um, just so you know, we're gonna go back to these. So if you need to take a pen and paper out, I suggest you might wanna do that. Uh, if you wanna ask questions about some of these definitions, when we have about seven or eight of them, um, at the end, we can talk more in detail about each of them. So um, can I get my reader for the second term? Of course, Dr. Brock. Racism, race, prejudice, plus misuse of, misuse of power by systems, institutions, and people. Thank you. So in this way, racism is just not an idea. It's a practice. It's a practice. My next reader. My next reader. Dr. Brock, you are our next re reader. Okay, all right. White supremacy. Now this is really interesting because uh, while this term has a long history, I think it has come back more in recent years to capture some of the things that are going on today, but it's it's really capturing things that have gone on since um, the evolution of um, of, um, uh, of of race. Uh, so white supremacy is based on the ideological belief that European and white intellectual, political, and historic contributions to global humanity are superior to those of people of color. So much so that they have become universal. It is white supremacy and this notion has become universal. It is so normalized that in the words of Michel Foucault, its power is everywhere, diffused and embodied in discourse, knowledges and regimes of truth. Um, I used to, I, 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 when my son was in school, I remember he did Macbeth with Shakespeare in fifth grade. He did Macbeth with Shakespeare in eighth grade. He did Macbeth with Shakespeare in 11th grade. And I remember thinking to myself, what about the African writers? What about the 
Chinese intellectuals? What about the Middle Eastern scholars? Um, and so when we think about white supremacy, we really do have to think about the ways in which knowledge and regimes of truth have been posited and continue to be posited throughout all of our uh, education systems um, throughout this country. So my next reader. Hi, uh, whiteness. Whiteness is the normalization of a white racial identity throughout the Americas that created a culture where non-white persons are seen as inferior or abnormal. This white dominant culture also operates as a social mechanism that grants advantages to white people um, since they can navigate society both by feeling normal and by being viewed and treated as normal. They also have the privilege of not seeing race should they choose not to, while black indigenous and people of color do not have that choice. Interestingly, this normalization is so twisted that for some to perceive a black person as normal or equal, they must codify them as white. So thank you. Uh, at the bottom here, and this is, a, this is a challenge for any of my listeners and you can put it in the chat. Uh, Pele, the very famous soccer player, football player from Brazil. Um, I ask you, is he white? And I'm just gonna leave it there. I'm gonna leave it right there. And I like the people to think uh, about that question and why I'm ask, asking it. And I'm gonna show a video um, that I think really speaks to this um, notion of whiteness in terms of normalization. And then also uh, this last point that I made that very often um, when a person is brought in, when a person is seen as okay, they often are codified as white. It's okay to laugh. So that I think we can talk about that video. It's a lot in there. Um, and I think it's quite interesting. Um, of course, it's, it's a comedic flair, but the issue of the ways in which race can be normalized or abnormalized based, based on what identity you claim or don't claim. Um, so we can talk about that. And Dr. Brock, there's just um, a quick question in the chat, I think related to some of the definitions we've been chatting through. Okay. Um, Carol, Carol asked, why should black be capitalized, but white is not capitalized? <laughs> oh, oh, I'm not gonna get in that right now. And I don't, I'm not quite sure what, she, yeah. I, I'd like to go through this before we do that. It's an editorial decision actually. Okay. Okay. Uh, who, who's my next uh, reader? You are Dr. Brock. Okay. Internalized racial superiority, a complex multi-generational socialization process that teaches white people to believe, accept, and live out superior societal definitions of self and to fit into and live out superior societal roles in relationship to people of color. And as you notice right here, I put a capital a W here because I think it's actually not that important uh, in some ways. Anyway, these behaviors define and normalize the race construct and its outcome. White supremacy, um, which is the outcome. France Fanon and Andrea Smith have called it the syndrome of the settler in a colonial context. That's internalized racial superiority, which happens so often as we've seen lately with um, people thinking they can call on a black person for bird watching, having a picnic, um, on folks speaking Spanish in a Starbucks and on and on and on. So we have a lot of evidence of this. Um, who's gonna read the next one? I will, Dr. Brock. Um, okay. Here we have internalized racist inferiority. This is a complex multi-generation, a complex multi-generation socialization process 
that teaches people of color to believe, accept, and accept societal definitions of people of color and to assimilate comfortably into white supremacist frameworks, i.e. Clarence Thomas, Larry Elder. Um, Keep going. France Fanon called it a syndrome of the native or comprador in the colonial context. So I had to bring um, Larry Elder into this today. Um, he is someone who is running for hope, would like to be governor of California. Uh, he's black. Uh, he's had a long-term conservative radio show. And he actually thinks that instead of reparations to the people who were enslaved, that the people who enslaved them should get paid for the loss of property. That's Larry Elder. I'm gonna play another video. It's called A Girl Like Me. And this one was actually uh, done by a high school student in New York City. Um, and it was a film project for her. And uh, it was, it's a very interesting take on um, the pressures uh, around uh, racism uh, on young black girls uh, in New York City and, and black people in general and how this internalized racist inferiority can actually happen to black people. Thank you. Um, Michelle, are we gonna, I mean, I wasn't, I mean, I, I don't, are we taking questions as I'm going through or were they gonna be at the end? Um, I just, um, I'm just wondering. We can, we can take them as we go, but there's also the question and answer box if people do have questions and we can stop in between your presentation, Dr. Brock, and share those questions with you. Okay, okay. Um, I did want to go back to answer the question about white and black. Um, uh, I think, you know, in, back in the day when black consciousness and um, black pride was developing in this country, uh, we decided to put a capital B on black to emphasize our pride in it. The issue of white, whether it's capitalized or, or not, I think is something that's still under discussion. I know people who are writing articles and books and different presses want to do it differently. Um, so, I mean, I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's an ongoing discussion about what to do with the word white, although the word black is pretty much decided that it should be capitalized as far as I know. So I did want to answer that question. Um, are there any other questions right now? I mean, I'm, Anything in the Q&A box? There is nothing right now in the Q&A. However, we do have some people sharing their experiences in the chat. We can either talk about that now, but I know you wanted some people to share at the end. So we might just pull some of those comments for then. Yes, let's wait for those. I think that'll be, that'll be a cool way to do it. Because uh, I, hmm? I okay. think Dr. Taylor has a question. Okay. Oh, we have one in the chat. It says, what year was the Kenneth Clark doll test repeated? The, the, the film was 2015. I'm not sure exactly when she did it, the student. If, I, if my memory serves me right, I can check that. All right, and then Dr. Taylor put in our chat, can black people be racist? <laughs> That's the question. That's the question. Um, I know that, um, uh, Ibram Kendi says Black people can be racist against ourselves. And I think that's where this internalized racist inferiority comes in. Um, you know, for many years uh, before we had a Clarence Thomas or a Larry Elder or Blacks for Trump, uh, we used to think uh, that Black people couldn't be racist because they didn't have power. Um, they didn't have power to misuse. Um, and so I think that is an evolving discussion as well. I was one of the ones that said black people didn't have enough power to be racist, uh, that they don't control where people live, they don't control the laws uh, that affect black people. But I think increasingly we are having um, more and more, or I say more, but it's still relatively few African-Americans who might support a uh, white supremacy in laws and policy. So I think it's under discussion, uh, Dr. Taylor. I think it's under discussion. I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear what people think about it. 
as well. But I should say it's not blacks, blacks are, can be racist against blacks, but they generally have no power to be racist against whites in this country. So I'll leave it there. And, I, and this gets to our next slide. Uh, was someone gonna read that or am I gonna read that? You are that definition. And then our last one will be Mr. Terrence. Okay. So this is a term uh, that has also gained um, uh, in, 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 in usage and understanding um, over the last few years. And it's, separate, it's separated a little uh, uh, from the notion of racial inferiority. And because it's about uh, folks being anti-Black in terms of color as well as what might be considered race. So I'm gonna read it. So anti-Blackness is based on the belief of a dehumanization of Black people, which sy uh, systemically shows up as white supremacy, internalized racial superiority and racism. However, it also shows up among people of color, white people and white people because of internalized racism and white proximis, proximity or adjacency. So the closer you are to being white, um, you can also be seen as better and people may see you as better because they're anti-Black. Colorism or the lighter, the whiter, the better is the way anti-Blackness shows up everywhere, but has particular meaning in countries that did not apply the one drop rule to race to the racial construct. Although that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen here in the US, it does, but it has, um, it, it, it's, it shows up in countries that have a more porous system of racial categorization. So for instance, in Cuba and in the DR, they have a three category racial system of black, mulatto and, and white. Same thing in Brazil. In Mexico, it's uh, uh, white uh, mestizo, um, um, white mestizo or Indian. So you have a three category systems that go on, but it also happens in, in um, and so what I mean in these systems very often it's better to be white than mulatto, better to be mulatto than black. And uh, I remember a Puerto Rican friend of mine who was in a family and just like these girls that you just saw, many of them were from the, uh, uh, have a heritage of the Dominican Republic. Um, and she was darker than her sisters and brothers and she was called the dark meat of the family. And that was seen as a derision or something people laughed at. So even within families in certain places, the darker, uh, the worse. And so anti-blackness can even play out at that, on that intimate scale. And, but it also plays out in mannerisms, values, attitudes, and what we call the politics of representation. Um, so I remember HBCUs, for instance, Howard and other HBCUs uh, for years would only have a light skin homecoming queen. Um, you also have black classism in, in this country and in other countries where you had cotillions of light skinned people. And of course, we've all familiar with the paper bag test in New Orleans, which was only certain people who were lighter than a brown paper bag could actually become a part of certain clubs. Um, I was really, uh, so this is anti-Blackness, so it can happen even among us as Black people, and has happened. Um, I remember Michael, oh, I just heard the other day, Michael K. Williams, that wonderful, gorgeous actor, um, uh, recently, who recently passed away, who was very dark-skinned, said that his Blackness caused him grief growing up even in the Black community of Brooklyn, that he did not see himself as beautiful. Um, for most of his life. So I thought that was very interesting. Dr. Brock, um, Dr. Taylor has her hand raised, so I'm not sure if she had something to add. Okay. Hi, Dr. Brock. <laughs> hi, Dr. Taylor. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for doing this for Sala and Howard. Um, I wanted to ask you if you could just maybe parse out this question that I asked. I wasn't being flippant, but I really, wanted to get into that debate over whether or not Black people can be racist, because I do think uh, Kendi's book and other Black scholars believe that it's possible. But in this new world that we're coming to, where we might be, um, where Latinos may be uh, the dominant uh, uh, ethnic group in the coming decades, 
um, can they be racist? And, um, you know, because they don't really have power either. And then if you could just give us some differences between, because there are a lot of Howard students on this call and Texas Southern, <laughs> give us the differences between bias, bigotry, prejudice, oh, racism, Lord. and white supremacy. Just oh. a working quick definition. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know if I'm going to give a working definition of all of those, but I'll, I'll put bias. Bias usually means that you lean into one thing more than another thing. And in the, in the racial situation, it means you may have bias against a certain race of people versus another. And it's an idea. Same thing with prejudice. Prejudice is an idea. Um, it's not necessary. We all can have prejudices one way or another against certain peoples. And we do. And I'm sure we see it even among the Black community. But racism has always, in my view, been when those ideas are, are able to be operationalized and put into practice and actually affect systems and people. Um, and so racism to me is an is a institutional systemic issue that affects and runs through all of the societies, especially in the Americas uh, where uh, there was enslavement and, and colonialism. Um, but you can have, so for instance, African-Americans might be prejudiced against Native Americans. Uh, you might have Latinos who are prejudiced against African-Americans. Um, but I would be, I mean, I think it's a discussion right now on whether or not folks have enough power to be racist within certain communities. That's why this term anti-Black, I think, is a way to deal with that. So if you're talking about certain Latino communities, this came up especially in Latino communities where you had Latino communities who came from uh, countries where uh, you, you have racism, but it's much more porous and malleable. So you can even have a black person in one's family and still be anti-black. Um, so um, prejudice is an idea without the power to do anything. Racism to me is the power to impact people's lives systemically, institutionally. And um, so it's, to me, it's less about an individual, whether an individual is racist or not. It's about how racism shows up in policy, um, in housing, in access to healthcare, and all of those kinds of things. Am I being a little, is that a little clear for you, Dr. Taylor? Yeah, I, th I think the students may find that to be very clear. Thank you. Right. So I, like I said, I have generally believed that Black people couldn't be racist because we didn't have the power to impact. We couldn't be racist against uh, Black people or white people because we didn't have the power to, to really affect things, uh, affect systems and institutions uh, in, without major protest, but not as just uh, a group of people. So, um, but prejudice is an idea. Racism is operates on a systemic level. So, um, okay. I think I just have a couple more. Uh, this one is cultural appropriation, and a cultural appropriation is an interesting one and a kind of tricky one for a lot of people. It involves members of a dominant group exploiting the culture of less privileged groups with little understanding or acknowledgement of the latter's history, experience, and tradition. Because of white privilege, commercial cultural appropriators profit from the cultural property of others, often without just compensation being given to those to whom it belongs. If the commodification of black bodies was justified through enslavement, of course, black culture could and would be by extension as well. Um, I bet you somebody was, was going to read that for me. I'm sorry. They were, but it is okay. <laughs> okay, they can read the next one, hopefully. Um, I want to show a, a, a short video that was done a couple years ago. It's called Don't Cash Crop My Corn Rose. And it's about cultural appropriation, uh, especially among uh, more recent uh, Black styles um, and music. Any questions or comments about that? 
Not particularly about that one, Dr. Brock, but we do have a few questions in the Q&A section. Um, if okay. You can answer. So the first one from an anonymous attendee asks, what do you say to our Black brothers and sisters from outside of the U.S. who strongly oppose the discussion of this topic or dealing with it in the marketplace and choose to take the economic rise instead of dealing with racism, colorism, and internalized racial inferiority? Hmm. Great question. It's, it's a really, it, it, the way they positioned it is people outside of this country. Um, I'm not quite sure who those people are. I mean, there's a discussion around Afro-descended people happening all over the Americas now um, in Latin America. Uh, and of course, Africa has colonialism and that colonial past, which is also racist. It may show up differently uh, in a predominantly white, uh, uh, black setting, but it does show up on the, on, in a, on the global scale. So I'm not quite sure who they're talking about that doesn't want to discuss this. Um, I think it has to be discussed as a part of a larger discussion. Um, and when we next week, we're going to talk about intersectionality and the idea that multiple oppressions happen across um, uh, uh, people and communities. And, and so we're going to talk about class as well. And then also in terms of economic rise, um, as long as there are racial barriers, um, there's only going to be a certain amount of blacks who will economically rise in this society. I mean, look at what happened with Wall Street and Wall, I mean, uh, Black Wall Street uh, when you had blacks who excelled. So we have to deal with racism. Uh, and of course, Black Wall Street in Tulsa was just one of many. There was Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, there was Rosewood. Uh, so there's a lot of places where when blacks excelled, uh, that internalized uh, white superiority uh, uh, flipped on in a certain kind of way. So um, I just think we have to continue to have this discussion if we're ever going to get beyond it, no matter where people are. So, and I think that is happening. So is there another question? Yes, we have several others. Um... One I have here for directly to the point you just made about cultural appropriation is uh, from an anonymous attendee is, and what is to be said to blacks that say cultural appropriation is flattery and the blacks, the Ibram <laughs> Kenti black racists like Timbaland and Dr. Dre who usher it right into the culture for their, for their own cash crop. <laughs> well, yes, I mean, there are, Black people who make money off of Black culture and they, they sell it. Um, uh, and they sell to certain types of culture because it fits sometimes uh, certain stereotypes. Uh, sometimes they challenge those stereotypes. But I think cultural appropriation, I mean, I was looking up before this talk today about Big Mama Thornton, who was a blues singer. And the song Ain't Nothing but, uh, but a Hound Dog was sung by her and she made it popular, but she never made as much money as Elvis did. Um, and um, I think uh, when you have these white rappers, I mean, they're making a lot more money than the average black rapper uh, is making. And I think racism has a big part to do with that. So, you know, cultural appropriation is interesting because, you know, we all borrow culture. I mean, everybody's gonna borrow uh, culture from each other, but when people borrow someone's culture that's less privileged and makes money off of it, and gives uh, none of that money back uh, to the uh, originators of it, uh, or it sits better when it comes from a white person than it does when it comes from a black person, um, then I think that's what cultural appropriation is. You know, we have a few black rappers and, and a few black stars and they're making money, but in the, in the, in the whole scheme of things, uh, in terms of the economics of the black community, um, they are a, a small percentage. So I'm gonna, can I keep going now and then we can come back to some? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So is someone gonna read this one or is it me? I uh, guess that would be me. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, oppression. In its traditional usage, oppression means the exercise of tyranny by a ruling group. Yet people are not always oppressed by cruel tyrants. In many cases, historic and systemic laws, policies, and practices can embed unquestioned harmful norms, habits, and symbols. 
This could mean treating certain groups of people in dehumanizing and violent ways for which there is societal justification and acquiescence, <laughs> uh, genocide, <laughs> like genocide and slavery. But it could also mean denying people language, education, and other opportunities, which would make them full partners in society. The, the, the meaning of Black English, Indian boarding schools. Iris Young, 1990, says, there are five phases of oppression, exploitation, economic, violence, state, extra state, powerlessness, political, economic, Marginal, marginalization, segregation, poverty, and cultural imperialism, theft and appropriation. Thank you. So oppression, the term oppression is the whole system, the way it works, the way it all works uh, together. And um, uh, I don't know if you all have been reading recently about these Indian boarding schools, which basically snatch kids from their parents and force them um, uh, uh, into Western thinking and Western ways um, and caused uh, just horrible harm um, to those Indian children, uh, many of whom died and were killed um, just for being Indian. Um, and so um, that's another, that's a form of oppression. It's a part of a whole system of white supremacy, of racism uh, in this context that we're talking about it today. So I'm going to end there with my um, terms. Um, and I don't, is there another question or, or should I just continue? You can continue and we can answer some of the questions after this slide. Okay. okay. So as everybody knows here, I'm a retired professor. I was a professor for 36 years. So I have to give you a, a little test <laughs> as a part of this webinar. So to see if you remember uh, some of the, the, the terms, the terms that I used are on the right. And I'm gonna share just a couple of my own stories. And I'd like you to um, um, think about um, which one of these definitions fits into my story. Um, and then I'm gonna ask you to share a, a story or two. And I'm told there's some in the chat. So when I went to Oberlin College for two years before I transferred to Howard, and uh, I transferred to Howard uh, after my sophomore year, and these were the kinds of experiences I had that kind of made me want to come to Howard. Um, so anyway, I, I, I just want to share this. So my first year, I'm a freshman in college, and um, I was taking a class on slavery, and they had a class on slavery. And uh, I was one of two black students in this class of about 30. And we were talking about the age old debate between um, whether or not racism came before slavery or slavery came before racism. Uh, slavery as we knew it in the Americas came before racism. And people were going back and forth. And um, one student said, well, um, since you had a lot of poor whites indentured servants in in Europe and people were being pushed off the land and into industries, there was a lot of poverty. Um, and uh, why didn't they just enslave white people if there wasn't some racism already present? That's an interesting argument, it has some merit. And this other young white male student says out of nowhere, why would you enslave whites when you have blacks? So, and when everyone kind of looked at him and he's like, what, 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 what did I say? What did I say? So I wanna ask, I wanna ask folks, which one of these definitions does that, sto does that story reflect on the part of that young man? Of course, I can't see people, so I can't call on people. So um, I'm looking at the facilitators to help me here. You would like them to answer yeah. verbally or would you like them to answer in the chat? Well, they can answer verbally if you can unmute them. Yes. Um, 
Let's start with Mr. Jerome Selden. Okay. If you would like to unmute yourself. Yes. Um, you want me to ask, answer that question? Yes. Okay. I see it as white supremacy. Yes. So deeply embedded, right? So deeply embedded that he doesn't even, we talk about the normalization. He doesn't even know that he said anything wrong or problematic. Let's say, let's don't use that word, or even problematic. Did anybody put anything else in the chat? Um, was Rose, Rose suggested it's also internalized racial superiority. Yes. 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 Okay. All right. I'm going to go on with my next story. And then people may have another, uh, may, may, uh, I want to see what they see at this. So when I was 12 years old, 1968, I, um, <laughs> I don't know if people, I know Dr. Higginbotham and uh, 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 Michelle are probably close to my age. So I'm 12 years old in 1968. You know, the world is a changing. Um, but I, at 12 years old, had just been able to get my hair pressed because uh, my mother wouldn't let me get it pressed earlier. By press, I mean straightened. My mother wouldn't let me get it done earlier because it was seen a little too grown up and womanish. Of course, that's very different now. And I remember I was 12 years old and I went down to the lady down the street, a Miss Carlisle who had, who did people's hair in her kitchen on her stove. And she had an original hot comb, the iron tooth with the wooden handle. And she put it over the gas, the flames of the gas stove, wash your hair out, dry it, and then put some oil on it. And then do that to straighten your hair. So I'm 12 years old. My sister was in college. And she had come home um, during the fall break and she asked me, she said, what have you done with your hair? And I said, I got it pressed. You know, I'm all feeling all grown up and everything. And she said to me, she said, girl, we're not doing that anymore. She said, this is 1968. I said, really? She said, yeah, we got to get you an Afro. So she took me in the bathroom and, you know, as soon as the water hit it, it, it fizzed back up. And, uh, and I had me, she cut it and I had me a little fro. So I was walking down the street, my street, and I saw Miss Carlisle. And she said, girl, what have you done with your hair? And I said, I got an Afro. And she said, well, you look like an African boogaloo. And I was, didn't know what to say. And so I just, you know, being me, I said, well, I wanna be an African boogaloo. I mean, I'm 12 years old, right? So in that story, Miss Carlisle represents what? In terms of my definitions. Can, can you all call on some people? This is not hard. Uh, we have A.M. Siner here. So let's see if they have an answer. I would say it was internalized. Racist inferiority? Yes, yes. Yes. That's uh, what I would say. Okay. Why would you say that? Oops. Am I, <laughs> am I muted? <laughs> can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, I, I'd say that because Miss um, Carlisle could not recognize your blackness. Uh, she identified blackness with uh, being a boogaloo, uh, sort of like the idea of um, the um, you know Africans. Uh, not being white, so she couldn't recognize or see the beauty of being black, even though she was black. Right, right, right. And um, yes. that, that happened a lot in the '60s. It happened a lot. It probably still happens in it's still some. Still happening today. Too. Yeah. Yes. You know, I think Whoopi Whoop Girl Goldberg tells the story of placing a towel on her head and putting a um, uh, clothespin on her nose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Long flowing hair and the uh, Romanesque nose with the. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay, I'm gonna do one final story and then I'm gonna turn to you all for some stories. Um, um, I had a colleague, she's passed away now. Her first name was Marilyn. 
And she said something to me that really, really struck me. Um, there was a big battle with the, at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign with the mascot. The mascot was generally a white male student who would dress up in a hodgepodge uh, outfit of indigenous uh, folks uh, uh, from the US. So he'd have a big feathered um, uh, head, head thing on his head, 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 head uh, feather thing on his head. And he'd have this outfit on and he'd jump around and, and um, simulate what he thought um, the, a chief of an Indian um, uh, people would do. And they called him Chief Illinois. And there was so much pressure uh, and a big fight to get rid of that stereotypical harmful racist uh, uh, chief. Uh, but it was very much a part of the identity of the sports teams of this major university. And so I remember talking to Marilyn, who was a white colleague of mine, and I said, I said, you know, Marilyn, we were just talking about it. And I said, you know, I, you know, I mean, University of Illinois was so wedded to it, they got kicked out of the NCAA and still refused to get rid of it. They got they they, they got kicked out of the NCAA because of it, because they refused to get rid of it. Finally, uh, ultimately they did. But I remember during that whole thing talking to Marilyn, and Marilyn said, well, if she went to University of Illinois. Urbana-Champaign for both undergrad and grad. And she said to me, she said, well, Lisa, if they take away Chief Alinawick, you're gonna take away my whole experience as a college student at the University of Illinois. And I said, what? And she said, yeah. She said, that's why we can't get rid of it is we identify with it so much. So I just looked at her and I, I <laughs> So I'll, I'll tell you what I said to her, but I'd like to know what people think um, her experience uh, reflects. Um, we have a, a couple of people answering in the chat, cultural appropriation. Mm. That um, is cultural. said whiteness. Whiteness. Marilyn represents whiteness. The normalization of the oppression of people of color. Uh, without, e again, it's so internal that she can't even see that it's problematic. Did you have another one? Another one said uh, cultural appropriation. I, it, it, it could be that too. It's so stereotypical and it's not a real culture. Um, so it is cultural stereotyping um, and using it for your own purposes. Um, yeah. And then we have also internalized racial superiority, oppression, and white privilege have been some answers as well. Yeah, it's all of that. It's all of that. And so all of these definitions very often work, work together. So I wanted to have some of the audience members share some of their stories. I mean, one of the things I think that's so important for learning, and I'm thinking even about the, the students that are here, um, I'm not sure, you know, how many people are here from different backgrounds and what age, what, what, whatever. But I think it's really in interesting because I think you can learn these terms in a in a conceptual or theoretical way, but how do they show up in everyday life? I think is what's also very interesting, and how we put those together and see where the points are that we need to struggle against. So I'd like some people to share some of their own stories with some of how these definitions fit in. Maybe um, a few, uh, two or three we could start with. So Dr. Brock, um, since that was the last thing we had on our list, I was wondering um, prior to that, did we wanna go through some of the additional uh, questions in the Q&A section um, first before going to that? And then a lot of folks have been sharing stuff in the chat. So for those of you who had some stories, I would encourage you to raise your hands um, now so we can call on you once the Q&A um, okay. section is done. That's fine, that, that works. Okay, so the first question we had was from Minister Annie Mosley, which was, why do we use the term white as a description for people? Why do we not call them Caucasian or European? Well, I think in the United States, um, we can't call them European anymore because Europeans live in Europe. 
Um, I think the way in which whiteness happened in this country um, is very special in, in some ways. And then other ways, of course, whiteness shows up in Latin America and other places in, in similar but also different ways. But I think we use white instead of European um, because to be white in this country has meant a whole lot um, in terms of uh, uh, the melting pot. It's so interesting to me. Um, I always say, you know, people talk about the United States was a melting pot. Uh, and then people have challenged that and said it's more of a salad bowl or different kinds of things. But I think for whites, it was a melting pot in that they, for a lot of people who came from Europe, um, they were a part of class systems uh, and religious systems uh, and ethnic systems in which some were oppressed and some were uh, on the top of that. And they came here and their whiteness melded together into something that um, is completely normal for them um, and, and benefited them if they decided to become white. Um, and I use that to decided to become white because they could have uh, chosen to continue to say I'm German or I'm Italian or whatever and, and, and live that out. But for the most part, most white Americans um, see themselves as Americans. Uh, and that whiteness is a part of who they are, like in Maryland's situation or in that boy's situation. I think, um, so I think that's why we do it. In terms of Caucasian, it's just not a term that um, uh, makes, uh, I mean, some people use Caucasian, but I think whiteness uh, in the United States situation and especially like in the South African situation uh, really speaks to the way in which white people from Europe came together. I'm going to mention a couple, one, um, one book uh, called How the Irish Became White is an interesting kind of story when the, you know, the Irish were very poor in Europe. They were colonized in Northern Ireland by Britain. So that was Britain colonizing Ireland, uh, both people who would phenotypically be considered white. Um, and they were at the bottom of the European totem pole. Uh, and then when they came here, um, um, they accessed something that was useful to them, and that was whiteness. Um, because only here <laughs> would people from Ireland be able to rise like they could, uh, uh, because in Europe, they were at the bottom of, 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 of the scale. And so, uh, and they understood that. And in fact, <laughs> when white males were arguing, white males of no property were arguing for the vote I don't know if people know this, but after 1776 and 1787, uh, you know, only white men with a certain amount of property could vote. Um, and over the years, poor white men or working class white men argued that they should be able to vote too. And what they argued was their whiteness and their gender um, to be able. And so state by state, white men of any economic status uh, was a, a, a got the vote. Um, and so I just uh, I think that this is, um, is very important. Um, so I'm not against using Caucasian, but I think in the context of the US, whiteness, uh, white supremacy, uh, these are terms that, that actually speak to what we're talking about. Yes. Um, next, we have a question from trying to look through some of these. Jerome Selden asked, do you agree that churches, black churches including have played a part in the way black children into their adult years see things, white Jesus, white angels, songs which states wash me white as snow? <laughs> I, yes, I, I imagine so. And I, I, I mean, it's, it's um, I'm not sort of close to children who are, um, steeped in the church now, but I do know that black liberation theology and liberation theology were ways in which to challenge the, the whiteness of, uh, of uh, Christianity, especially. Um, and, and going back to Christianity's origins, uh, being in uh, Sudan, Ethiopia, Egypt, um, that there were actually Christians there before Christianity rose um, to such prominence in Europe. So I do know that their Black liberation theology has attempted to address that, which is a good thing, I think. Um, Denise Johnson asks, 
she said, well, stated that she appreciated the video. However, she was wondering about the young woman's use of the term meat. Meat compared to what standard? Is this internalized racism itself? Um, I'm not sure what she what she's talking. She said meat. Neat. Neat. N e a t. I'm, this is the video. What you I'm thinking it's the cornrow video with the um the hair you had shown just a few minutes ago. Cornrow. Mm -hmm. Oh, about keeping hair neat. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, one might critique uh, Amanda. Um, uh, that's the young woman's name for um, uh, deciding that that's a term, but I think she probably meant that. Um, one of the reasons we braid our hair is um, to keep it from uh, a little bit of detangling in some ways, uh, probably, so that when you, when you wake up in the morning, you, <laughs> um, you don't scream when you, when you comb your hair, maybe. But I think she was just saying that whatever neat is to you, that corn rolls and, and doing hair in certain ways or, or braids or plaits was a way that people um, um, did things to their hair um, to keep it the way they wanted. So I'm not gonna make a value judgment on what need is to everybody, um, but, but I think that she was talking about it, that it's not just a style, that it actually has some purpose um, for the growth of our hair, the condition of our hair and things like that. But that's an interesting point. I had never thought of that before. Okay. We'll do one. We have one more. We'll do one more uh, Q and A question before asking folks to share. Um, Jason Seals asks: Is there really a love for Black culture, or simply a practice of exploiting Black culture and Blackness? <laughs> That's an interesting point. I'd like to hear what he says, or she, or they. Mr. Seals, can you? Are you willing? If you raise your hand, I can uh, bring you up. It'll be easier that way for me to find you. There he goes. You have to tell him. You are as, there he goes. Uh, good evening. Um, I, I think in terms of the question, you know, I struggle with how white America views people of African ancestry. And I really think that like when I was looking at the videos and I appreciate the images of the videos, so thank you for sharing them. I think the images for me is more about exploitation. When I see Iggy Azalea or I see, you know, these pop stars, uh, hip hop stars making all this money, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if they have a deep love for what it means to be a part of Black America. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, if they understand the, the, the pride and the legacy. I think they understand what it means in terms of profit. Uh, I, I think some of us as African people are still learning what it means to truly love who we are because of anti-Blackness and colorism. So, you know, I really wanted to hear your opinion because I'm, I'm open to other ideas. <laughs> but when I see, I, when I see, you know, them popping up, I just be like, do they really love our culture? Yeah. Or is it the six figures that they love? Right. Well, so, it, yeah. well, I think what you're touching on is what I would call appropriation is, is that they're, they're using it for their own purposes, whatever that is. Often it's, it's money purposes, it's career purposes. Um, uh, and I think it's an interesting point about love, like what is love? I think uh, Azealia Banks was saying you know, she calls it appropriation when you take it and you really have no sense of where the history comes from, you know, um, or why people are doing what they're doing um, and the legacy and the history and all of that. So I really do think, um, I think you're raising a really interesting point. I mean, um, that could be a, a, an essay that you write, <laughs> that you, you weigh, because I, I don't think there are set answers for all of these things. I think there are some people who might really have loved, I was just thinking about like the Beatles or uh, the Rolling Stones who did at least verbally, and I know to, in both cases, sometimes economically, 
uh, supported uh, the people who produced a lot of the music, especially the blues music uh, that came out of Chicago um, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and influ and 60s that influenced them. So they have actually given a claim to the founders of that music and actually given some money to various things that promote um, the health and well-being of some older blues musicians. But then there are others like that, um, some of the, the newer ones, the girl who was twerking and all of that stuff. I mean, I don't know if you can call any of that love. That's the straight up appropriation. Um, but I do think, you know, as cultural producers, uh, um, we are really strong cultural producers and um, we're always doing it. And uh, there are folks always listening. And a lot of people who do not have as much talent as a lot of these, um, uh, uh, these black artists um, are, are yearning and striving for a way to, to, to get in and they, they take it and take it as their own. So I hear you, I mean, it's a question. I mean, I, I don't have an answer about, about love but appropriation is exploitation. So um, I think what you see in the, in the music industry and in the cultural field um, is, um, is, is a lot of appropriation. So thank you for that. All right, we can take some stories or anybody that wants to share, if you could raise your hand in the chat, that would be great. Um, Dr. Brock, we're actually gonna stop your PowerPoint if you don't mind, that way we can see you in big screen and anybody who would like to share. Okay. It's very difficult too when I can't see people, so it's, it's nice. Um, no problem. They won't have a video, but they'll have their voice. Um, okay. And we'll start with someone we heard from, haven't heard from yet. Miss or uh, Mr. or Mrs. Patterson. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So the question I asked the audience here, did I do wrong? And here's my story. <laughs> in 1968 and 69, I integrated a local high school in South Carolina. Hmm. Uh, 69 and 71, I went to Atlanta, Georgia, the ATL, majored in computers and came back to the same hometown looking for a job. Mm -hmm. uh, I was duped by being told I was overqualified for the job. Okay, so then um, 1972 through 73, I integrated a local uh, teacher's college. Mm -hmm. And the only music that was playing in the jukebox in the, in the cafeteria was Killing Me Softly by Roberta Flack. Right. Loaded plenty of quarters in there just to play it repeatedly over and over. But I felt more comfortably eating in the boiler room with the custodians and the groundkeepers. Mm -hmm. There's a saying, if there isn't a back door, Negroes will build one. <laughs> Did I do that or was it that I just wanted to associate with my people and feel comfortable rather than representing in those classes all day long as being sometimes the only black? And I toyed with that question seriously without an answer today. Help me, please. <laughs> well, that's a really interesting story and it's a common story. Um, you know, the book by uh, Beverly Tatum called Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Yes, yeah. Really good book about this. And, you know, she's got a new um, introduction to it as well. And what she discovered is that, um, for people, for, for, um, for Black people and other people of color in this country, but especially for Black people, um, we come to understand race because we have racist experiences um, a lot uh, and early. And whether or not we're in a formally integrated situation like you were or not, I mean, it could be going to the store, you know, it could be, you know, going to a local restaurant or a swimming pool and not getting in or, um, some sleight of hand somewhere. So she argues that in some ways people, these kids of color and, I, and you, you had every right to seek a psychic safety, right? With, with your own people. Um, you have a right to self care. You have a right to feel like you're welcomed and supported. And so you were not wrong, um, but you also weren't wrong for going to that school. 
Um, I think we can do, we can, and we often do do both, but we also need um, psychic and mental self-care. To be in an environment where people don't want you or don't like you all the time, it's not healthy. Um, and so what she discovered in, with, the, with the kids was that that's what was happening. Is these kids are battling racism in the classes, like that kid I told you that when I was at Oldman or or they somebody says something in the hallway or heaven forbid it's Halloween, you know, and folks got blackface and sombreros and stuff running around. So, you know, you, you find safety with people who have, have similar experiences and are not um, uh, um, racist uh, against you. So I don't think you were wrong uh, in either instance to go to the school and to seek uh, support from fellow black folks if that's an answer for you. It is. We see it all the time in predominantly white institutions. Um, and it's so interesting, a lot of institutions, when I went to Kalamazoo College, the Dean of Students there didn't believe that students of color should have things on their own. And we had to fight for that with them because they were like, oh my God, you know, I was called the N word in the dorm last night. And I had a teacher who didn't call on me and I had this and I had that. And, you know, heaven forbid, it's soul food day in the cafeteria. And, and uh, you know, then I can't find a safe space where I can talk about these experiences with people who understand. Um, and so um, one other thing that they discovered is at predominantly white institutions, when you have places where students of color can come together on their own, they matriculate better. There, it, it helps them get through um, an institution. So I hope that's helpful. All right, we are going to take um, Miss Seiner next. Here we go. And then we'll end with Dr. Hickenbotham. I, I just really wanted to speak to Mr. Patterson just very oh, quickly. No problem. Okay, Mr. Patterson. Well, I can't on video. So let me just say this to Mr. Patterson and to everyone. I. I want to commend you actually. You know, there's so many times we are in situations in our schools when we see custodial people who work there and we don't even speak to them. You know, one of the things that has always um, moved me, I, and I think of my late husband, Judge Leon Higginbotham, who uh, worked in the courthouse and who also taught at NYU, but he used to always say that he had such, he, he spoke to the custodial people, he knew their names, they even knew, they wouldn't even, they would even invite him to their, their kids' graduations and things like that. I, I, I think it's important that we recognize our people who work in all these kinds of positions. Because a lot of times when we as professors or as, you know, quote, important people, those people are invisible mm -hmm. and, they, and they shouldn't be. So I do commend you, um, Mr. Patterson. Thank you, Dr. Hickenbotham. All right, Ms. Seiner, Senator Seiner. I don't have a story. Oh, she doesn't have a story. Jerome Selden. Ah, Jerome Selden, here we go. Hello? Hi. Yes. I wanna say that I had a student, I taught um, for 33 years, and I had a student who was an extremely smart kid and he went to Duke University for undergrad. And so he, when he finished, he went to Howard for law school. But he came to me and told me how uncomfortable he was at Duke. And the same thing applied to, I think you said a few moments ago, where he says he would raise his hand in a lot of classes and teachers would, professors would not even call on him and how other students sat apart from him, even though there were some black kids who would not sit with him. So he said when he went to law school at Howard, he was almost not ready to even you know, participate because he had been shunned so long at Duke. But he 
he got his confidence when he saw how comfortable other black kids were, uh, young people were, and the professors were, you know, having a real interchanging kind of situation with them. So he became comfortable. And he wishes, he said, every day that he had not gone to Duke University and had started at, at Howard. But, you know, we, we, we do things like that, you know, because we don't, kids don't expect that kind of treatment. And this was in the 90s when this happened. Wow. Thank you. And I've enjoyed you immensely because I taught African-American literature for seven years. Okay. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for joining. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, you know, I, I think people are going to make their own choices, but um, there, there is racism at predominantly white institutions. And I agree with Dr. Higginbotham. Uh, one of the things we did um, at the Arcus Center is whenever we would have a big program, um, we would always take the custodial staff, all of them. Uh, we would take them, we would all, well, we knew who they were, and then we would also treat them to a lunch or a dinner. Of, um, you know, we would take them out somewhere um, just to thank them for supporting the, the center um, and, and being there. And some of them actually participated in our events as well. So that was always good. encourage folks to say yeah. the uh Thank dr you know. brock it has been so nice this evening um i want to i want to thank you we're a little early but i feel like we've covered your themes and um, i want to thank the people who stepped up to participate as well as the whole team here from masala uh, who did a, a wonderful job uh, Dr. Higginbotham, did you want to uh, provide additional remarks? Yes, thank you. My additional remark is come back for workshop two because it just gets better and better. Dr. Brock, you were so fascinating, so smart. We have loved every bit of this and we can't wait to see what you're gonna to bring to us next Wednesday for our social justice workshop. Thank you so much. And I see um, Dr. Taylor, did you wanna make a remark as well? No, she's saying no, okay. <laughs> so thank you all for joining us tonight. We look forward to seeing you next week. And um, again, I really want to thank the team for uh, helping us with the interaction and uh, with bringing up well all of you all who are, are, um, are interested in the topic. <laughs>